Today our topic is, is the Trinity biblical? Uh, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, is it, is it biblical? And by Trinity, I'll define it in particular what I am referencing and what I mean, but we'll look at that and find out uh, really, is it, is it biblical? Uh, there's some that, that teach and share that it is uh, a man-made idea. And when we talk about Trinity, I should probably level set for the purpose of uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, the Catholic Church and even in the Protestant churches are different definitions. And so typically when, in terms of Trinity, uh, what, what is meant by that in the context of uh, Catholicism is one thing and what is meant by it uh, in, the, in the context of Protestants and some Protestants, you can't lump them all together because there are you know, hundreds of groups of Protestants. So it's hard to say this is, quote, Protestant teaching. So there's a general uh, idea that is there. But then certainly, as relates to us, we'll talk particularly in terms of Seventh-day Adventist teaching in, the, in perspective of, of, of the Trinity. And so you hear the term Trinity, we, of course, instant, you're probably thinking then of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, when we look at the breakout of it, we, we, we will be clear to, to understand that we're not as espousing, and I'm not espousing a view of modelism, which would suggest that there are three different divine roles played by one person. So, so, so you think of that when we read in the Bible, we learn of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in that uh, revelation of God, that there is one God, all right, one, one supreme being, uh, one God, one ruler overall. And the scriptures teach us of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those who believe in, in modelism essentially believe that this one God appears in three different ways. And so if you put it a different way then, that he appears as the Father, he appears as the Son, he also appears as the Holy Ghost. So if you were doing a play, and maybe you, in the play, you might have three roles, okay? So you, you're one person, but you may be acting three roles in a play. And that's just how modelism is, that is one person, but appearing and acting in three different ways. That is not the context of what Scripture is showing us, and we'll, we'll find out for sure that the Bible does not teach us that there's one God that appears as the Father, and then he more or less takes a hiatus, and then he comes back again on scene two and appears as the Son, and takes a hiatus, and he comes back on scene three and appears as the Holy Spirit. Now, there are people that believe that, but that is not the teaching of Scripture. Uh, nor are we polytheists or tritheists. And that is that people who worship more than one God. And there are Muslims say, well, how, how can you be a, be a Christian and you worship multiple gods? Because you say God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's, that's three gods. How can you worship three gods when the Bible says that there's only one God, one Lord, uh, one faith, one baptism? We're not polytheists or believe in three different gods or three gods that we worship. No, no we're monotheists, not polytheists. Poly meaning many, mono meaning one. Theos, God. Uh, not multiple gods, but we worship one God. So we'll, we'll certainly understand and explore that again today. We have to go back a little bit in antiquity to be able to lay a foundation. Uh, and there are different beliefs and so forth as it relates to Jesus and it relates to the spirit and certainly to relation to the father. One of the main themes that you will see not listed in the scriptures, but you'll find in history is the belief of Arianism. This becomes particularly of interest as we study Daniel chapter 7 because there were several kingdoms that were Aryan nations. You'll find out, you'll read about them in history, though, the word Aryan nations. And so you essentially had your pagan nations, as such people that worship stocks and wood and idols, etc. And then you had the conversion to Roman Catholicism. And then there was a, a shift that you also had Aryan nations. And the Aryan nations and the Catholic nations they would war uh, many times against each other. And, and one of the bases of it was the belief in the teachings on this tenet of Arianism. And, and what is Arianism? Well, in short, uh, what the idea, the main, uh, the main piece of it was, was that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, who was begotten by God the Father, uh, with the difference that the Son of God did not always exist, but was begotten within time by God the Father. In other words, Arians believed that Jesus was a created being. Just kind of simply put, all right, that he was created, created as the son of God, um, and thus he was. 
and therefore he was not uh, co-eternal with the Father, or eternal with the Father, um, because of the fact that he came about as a part of creation. So meaning that there was God, and then God created the Son. And that was the, the view that was espoused by, uh, by Arianism. That, yeah, that we believe that Christ is the Son of God, uh, but that he being the Son of God is by creation. Uh, in the Council of Nicaea, which was in 325, it said that the, uh, the Christ was of the same substance as the Father. Uh, the Christ was of the same substance of the Father. And so this was the, the pushback of the church. So the Arians had come from, uh, some would su uh, suggest pagan backgrounds, that, that's debated. And, but they espoused the view that Christ was created. And the church pushed back against this and said, no, no, Christ was not created. And so in the council, and the church would have different councils, and they would come back and they would establish uh, doctrine and dogma and tradition and what would be the place, how would the church be governed. And in the council of Nicaea in 325, um, they decreed that he was of the same substance as the Father. Okay? Uh, and so that became the, um, the basis and the, the platform of, of then the Trinity, uh, what would become known then as the Trinity, that the Son was of the same substance of the Father. Again, Arians were essentially saying that the Son was created by the Father, but the church pushed back and said, no, 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 no. The Son is of the same substance as the Father. And then in the Council of Florence, which was 1338 to 1445, Their definition was really uh, pretty simple. It taught uh, that there is one nature in God and that there are two processions, three persons, and four relations that constitute the blessed trinity. In this, and please note this because this is going to be our, a working definition to go off of, that the Son proceeds from the Father and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So the basis for... The, the Trinity in the, the uh, Catholic faith is that the Son comes from the Father, and the Father and Son bring forth the Spirit. Uh, repeat it once more. The Father brings forth the Son, and the Father and the Son bring forth the Holy Spirit. That is the context in Trinity as is taught by Catholicism. Now, I know that there are some people who would say, well, I don't believe that and haven't thought that and so forth. Again, I'm not saying what you believe, what you think. I'm using the term as it is defined in the Catholic faith. And so this is in the Catholic faith, their understanding of Trinity. Because if someone says that you believe in, in the Trinity, then me, myself, okay, I'm not asking about you. Me, myself, I would say yes. However, my understanding of it is going to be different from their understanding. And it's the same as if someone said, do you believe in prayer? I would say yes. My understanding may be different from the understanding of someone else. Uh, someone might say, do you believe in, in the rapture? And again, I might say yes. I would say yes. But my understanding is different from your understanding. The, the reason that I state that is I don't want to get caught up in words. A lot of people get caught up in words. And there are some that attack uh, the, the church, because they say, well, the church believes in the Trinity. You know, and you, you will find that in some publications and so forth. And so in finding it in some publications, it's not saying that you believe the, the same idea and so forth, okay? Uh, it, it's the same as you believe in the Bible. And there are other faiths that believe in the Bible as well, but then they also, you know, I guess you might say, well, which one? <laughs> right, because in the, in the Mormon faith, you say, well, you know, we believe in the Bible. And then, you know, the, the Book of Mormon is another book in addition to the Bible. You know, in the Jehovah's Witness faith, it would be um, the, uh, the New Living Translation and so forth. They have, you know, uh, their own basis. And uh, in the Catholic tradition, in the Catholic faith, there be the Apocrypha may be added into it. Okay, and you say, well, we believe in the Bible. Again, it's just a word. But there's some that will, will pick fault with the church. Like, for instance, in, as, if, for instance, in the hymnal, one of the songs is... Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. God in three persons, blessed what? 
trinity. And there are people who have a conniption, you know, have a cow. Like, hey, the, the, the church is going to, going to hell. Why? Because it has this song in the hymnal that says we believe in the trinity. And that, they're, they're all caught up, in, and that's a you know, big uh, axe to grind. Or the church is trying to teach uh, sun worship. How? Because it has a song that says when I break bread, to, when we break bread, let us break bread together on our knees. When I rise on my knees with my face to the rising sun. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Look, the church is teaching sun worship. The Catholic Church uses Trinity in, in their understanding as such. And if you talk to the average person that's Catholic, uh, they, they probably aren't going to say the Father brings forth the Son, and the Son and the Father together bring forth the Holy Ghost, they're going to probably say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, that, that's how it is generally used in expression and talking together. So the technical definition from, from dogma and from uh, teaching is as such as I have identified here, and I got this from, uh, from, from their, uh, their site and so forth, so this is not something I'm giving you what others say, this is what they say themselves. But if you talk to Joe Average... And, Joe, and you ask Joe Average, well, what is the Trinity? He's going to say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Really, regardless of, of the faith that one may come from. Uh, in the Council of Florence, they found these four things. One, the Father actively and eternally generates the Son, constituting the person of God, the Father. The Son is passively generated of the Father, which constitutes the person of the Son, the Father and the Son actively spirate or produce the Holy Spirit in the one relation within the inner life of God that does not constitute a person. Okay? And then fourthly, the Holy Spirit is passively spirated of the Father and the Son, constituting the person of the Holy Spirit. So again, I've just abbreviated for you what they're saying. All they're saying is that the Father um, brought forth the Son, the Father and Son together brought forth the Spirit. Okay? That, that's all they're saying. Uh, that is their uh, particular belief as such. As such, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, in theological terms, subsistent relations. There's an opposition, so to speak, among them. The Father is Father to the Son. The Son is the Son to the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. There is a real distinction between the three persons, though they are all the same substance. And again, that was a pushback, again, uh, of, of, to Arianism, because Arianism said that Jesus was created. And the church, the Catholic church, said, no, he was not created. He is God. But he came forth from the Father. And the Father and the Son bring forth the Spirit. Now, what of Protestantism? And, and again, different Churches will have different beliefs, so I can't, couldn't go through all of them to try to exhaust. I picked just one as an example. This is from um, the Baptist Church, and it, and it says that the Bible reveals God to us as one and three persons. I'm reading from the middle here. But it does not tell us exactly how the Trinity works, nor can this be understood merely by our intellect. Our faith and experience are very important for our understanding while the Trinity is a fundamental truth of our faith, it is amazingly practical for our life experience. And so they believe again in the, the concept of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that is uh, Protestantism. Well, what does the Bible say? Uh, and, and what does the Bible teach upon this particular topic? And I ask you a question. Uh, and... 1 John, I think I had this in backwards. I do. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. If you turn with me there in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. So we have two views thus far. One of Arianism, and Arianism suggested that Christ was a created being. And then we have the other view that was brought forth by the church that suggested that the Father brought forth the Son. And that the Father and the Son together bring forth the Spirit. And that was again espoused by the church. Well, what about the Bible? What does the Bible say in relation to that? Because that would be what would be most important. So in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 5 
and verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. And you probably could quote this. It says, and there are three. There are how many? There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and what? And the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? Are one. These three are one. And you've heard that text a time or two in evangelistic series when we've talked about the Godhead of the Trinity. Because the, the word Trinity will not appear in Scripture. The concept of, of three in one will appear. We'll talk about the Godhead later on. But you've probably read this text a time or two in, in an evangelistic series. Am I right or wrong? All right, and, and the, the whole idea from that is that, look, there are three that bear record in heaven. Who are these three? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And what about these three? They're one. And then, and then we went over to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we drop down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we said the Word was Jesus. So we say, look, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are are one. How, how many of you have heard that before? Yeah, I, th I think everybody has. Um, how many of you have heard that that text does not exist? So I, I probably should have qualified before I started that, that, uh, that, that some of the things we're going to talk about that will it's going to challenge uh, your thinking. It's going to challenge your, uh, your perspective. And some people are going to be a little uncomfortable. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to make you uncomfortable. That's not by my job or my intention. My intention is just to be able to, uh, to, share, uh, to share the truth. And if the truth makes you uncomfortable, then I'm sorry about that. So be it. Uh, but you have to work that out with you and God. Now, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just trying to do my best as the mailman. But 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, it doesn't exist. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Um, I just read it in my Bible that it is there. If you read in the New International Version, and somebody said, well, oh, oh, there you go, New International Version. That's, that's Catholic, and, and the Catholics put that out. And they put that out because they're trying to attack the, the truth, and uh, that, that's the purpose of it. it you know, they, they got it from uh, the um, false uh, translations. They didn't use the Texas, the Texas Receptus. They got it from the uh, Vaticanus and so forth, and then Sinaiticus. And they've got these corrupt texts. It's not there. Well, if you look in the... Uh, let me try to find it here. Must, uh, pieces got a little out of order. But there we are. And 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 in the New International Version uh, says there are three that testify. Now, that's a big difference, is it not? All right, so we're looking at it from, from our own supposition, how we read into it like, hey, they're trying to hide um, truth. They're trying to hide something from us. They're trying to hide the Trinity because they, and then you can jump off into what they believe this and so forth. And well, if the Catholic Church did it, it must be wrong. Uh, well, every, is every, everything that the, the, a church does is not right or wrong. Everything that the Seventh-day Adventist church does is not right. And there are various teachings that, that uh, have come in the church and so forth that aren't right. So what are you talking about? I well, remember when this, the, the, the Sabbath was first kept. People keep it from 6 in the evening to 6 at night. We talk about tithing. There was no system of tithing um, that was first introduced in the church. So today, we customarily and, root, and, and regularly, we say it, tithing is to return what? Tenth. And like it was in the Bible, you know, right there. You know, when we had the text for it and so forth. Did you know when the church started, they weren't tithing? Uh, you, you'll read about it, they called it systematic benevolence. And, and essentially what that idea was, was that, you know, give, just give to God something. You know, systematically, regularly. Um, benevolence, like a gift. Give something regularly. So it wasn't a tithe as such. 
And then there are other ideas in terms of communion and so forth, and, uh, but, but I digress. The point being is that God leads his people, but our understanding in various faiths and so forth continues to, to develop. I also want to say this in regards to the, the topic that we're looking at today. Some people think that doctrinal perfection is, is required of everyone. You know, the doctrinal perfection is required of everyone. What is required of everyone is to grow into the stature and the maturity of Christ Jesus. And that's the difference between those two things. Everyone is not going to understand everything. We're not all going to see everything in the same lens. But there are going to be the basic fundamentals and so forth that, that should be a part that, that's interwoven. And in, in i.e., um, Christ Jesus died for our sins, that we have received him as our Savior, that we've repented of our sins, we've asked for a new heart, that we have been forgiven of our sins, we're now seeking to walk in the newness of life. We're trying to reflect his character, his glory, uh, honor him by obeying his words, living up to his commandments, um, et cetera, by surrendered will unto him. Now, 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 that is different from, quote, doctrinal purity. And, there are many people, I'm not, and it is not me saying that we should not seek to understand the scripture, and the scriptures, by studying them, will be brought into a closer relation, absolutely. But there are some that will allow their understanding of a certain verse to keep them at arm's distance from somebody else. Well, John 5, 7, it says there are three that testify. And I it would submit the question, well, which one is correct? You say, well, maybe I should ask. Which one of these is correct? I mean, because there's a big difference. First John 5 and verse 7, the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Uh, the New International Version reads it that there are three that testify. First John chapter 5 and verse 7. Now, if I say which one of those is right, uh, I, I'm willing to bet, and I'm using that, not literally, but I'm, but I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that most would raise their hand and say 1 John 5, 7 is correct. And, and if I ask why you would say that, you probably would say because it's in your Bible. But if you grew up using the New International Version or a different translation, and if I ask you that same question, say, well, which one is correct? Chances are then you would probably say, well, 1 John 5, 7 in my Bible is correct. And if I asked you why, you would say, because it's in the Bible. Well, which one is correct? Uh, which, which idea is correct? Do you think that it is uh, accurate? Uh, so there is a, uh, I, I submit to you that 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, as, as read in the King James Version Bible, uh, is incorrect. Now, now before you... Uh, you know, have, have a conniption, let me, let me explain. And then again, I would challenge you to go into do your research uh, and then see what conclusion that you come to. Uh, but scholars call this or refer to this as the Johannine comma. And the idea is that it's an uh, interpolated phrase that's inserted there. Interpolated means it's like an addition, it's a uh, comma. It's placed in there. So the whole reading in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, uh, it is um, placed in there. So the text with the comma in italics and enclosed by square brackets in the King James Bible version reads that there are three that bear record, in, that there are three that bear record, and this is the part that is put in. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. So it really would read that for there are three that bear record, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. And let me further explain. Erasmus was the person who uh, translated and the Greek text. 
And as Erasmus was working on this, there are no manuscripts, no Greek manuscripts that have 1 John 5, 7 in it. It doesn't appear until the 14th or 15th century. And he, it is stated that he said, listen, if you can find me one manuscript that has it written that way, I'll place it in my translation. And they found one manuscript uh, in a monastery that had it written that way. And so he placed it in his translation. Prior to the 14th and 15th century, it did not exist. Okay, so if you're looking at, if you have 100 documents and 99 say this way, and you come across one document that has it a different way, based on the weight of evidence and, and some other factors, then you would bring the one that's, that, that is different, that would appear suspect, would it not? When all the other 99 say it a different way, when you go back through antiquity, you can't find it um, any, any place else that doesn't exist, then that, that brings a question there. So it's not in any, any Greek um, manuscripts. And again, you can go back, and I don't want to waste I shouldn't say waste, but spend all of our time talking about that. I'm going to give you a high-level overview, brief understanding of it, and you can certainly go back and, and look at it. But there is not, it does not exist there in, in Scripture. So it is uh, referred to as this uh, Johannian com, uh, comma, that it is, it is placed there in Scripture, but it does not accurately belong there. I'll read this to you. It says, the passage is given in the King James Version is in no Greek manuscript earlier than the 15th or 16th century. I'm sorry, I said the 14th and 15th. So 15th and 16th centuries. The disputed words found their way into the King James Version by the way of the Greek text of Erasmus. Uh, a library in Dublin produced such a manuscript known as 34, and Erasmus included the passage in his text. It is now believed that the latter editions or later editions of the Vulgate acquired the passage by the mistake of a scribe who included an exegetical marginal comment in the Bible text that he was copying. The disputed words have been widely used in support of the doctrine of the Trinity, but in view of such overwhelming evidence against their authenticity, their support is valueless and should not be um, used. Uh, it is now generally held that this passage called the Comma Johannium is a glo gloss uh, a gloss that crept into the text of the old Latin Vulgate at an, at an early date, but found its way in the Greek text only in the 15th and 16th centuries. So, what do we do then? If, uh, if, if we go off of the supposition that 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 is this interpolar text that these pieces are added in, what do we do then? Does that mean that this does not exist? Does that wash away everything? Uriah Smith, uh, commenting in his book on Daniel and Revelation, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, talked about Jesus, the source of blessing. It says, from him which is and which was and which is to come, are is to be an expression which signifies complete eternity, past and future, and can be applicable to God the Father only. This language, we believe, is never applied to Christ. So Uriah Smith, even in 1882, in referring to Christ, what view would he be falling, falling under? Would that be like an Aryan view? Or would it be like a, a Catholic view? So he says the only one that is from complete eternity, past and future, is God the Father only. So based on the definitions we talked about, which one would he be in his belief? Arian or Catholic, if we, you want to use that term? Let's talk about those two definitions. Arians believe then that Christ was a created being. Catholics believe that Christ um, was of the same substance as the Father. So based on that then, Uriah Smith, and his theological understanding would be an Arian. 
Because he's saying the only one that had this ability is the Father only. Whereas the church said, no, the Father produced the Son, but the Father and the Son are of the same substance. Uh, so you, Smith espoused then uh, that view. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, moreover, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Some understand by this language that Christ was the first created being, dating his existence far back before any other created being or thing, next to the self-existent and eternal God. But the language does not necessarily imply this, for the words, the beginning of the creation, may simply signify that the work of creation, strictly speaking, was begun by him. And it is expressly declared that without him was not anything made that was made. Others, however, take the word to mean the agent or the efficient cause, which is one of the definitions of the word, understanding that Christ is the agent through whom God has created all things, but that he himself came into existence in a different manner, as he is called the only begotten of the Father. It would seem utterly inappropriate to apply this expression to any being created in the ordinary sense of that term. So again, he is espousing then that Christ was um, a created being. Now, that's not to say throw Daniel and Revelation away or out. But Mrs. White talks of Daniel and Revelation and says this is essentially a, a great book um, that, that is one that people should have. And so there are some who, who espouse within the church the belief that Christ is a created being and their, their, their justification are for some pieces. And even John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, they'll say that, you know, that text does not exist in the original manuscripts. And then when we look at the statement of Uriah Smith, and then we combine that with the statement that she makes, endorsing his book, then there's some look that would say, well, she was endorsing his views. Well, if we make that supposition, we make that conclusion, then we would also have to say, well, then that means that everything in the book she was espousing. So when he talks about Turkey in Daniel chapter 11, in Revelation chapter 16, the Battle of Armageddon, Turkey, and the Battle of Nations, and so forth, then, then that would mean, then, then she's saying, kind of carte blanche, blanche, everything that he said is, is correct. That was not the idea, no. Uh, the, the, the basic thing of what she was saying is that, listen, this is the best that we have, let's use it. You've, you've been in a work situation like that before, that you have used, you've improvised, and you've used the best tool that you had at that time. You know, uh, I, I like to say, you know, you uh, like you ghetto fire. It's not not the, what the tool is intended for or designed, but you're using what you have until you can get something better. And when you can get something better, then you go to that which is is better. So this is not an approval in terms of teaching, but just the overall scope. But it opened up many basic and wonderful things to the understanding of folks as they were able to receive it and to be able to learn. Uh, but they push back and say that, no, Jesus is a created being. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read Proverbs chapter 8 in its entirety, but a few portions I want to highlight. Proverbs chapter 8. A few portions I want to highlight. You can read it. And, uh, and therein it says that, that counsel is mind and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes de decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Uh, further on, it says that the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was. So, so uh, whoever is talking in Proverbs chapter 8 says, that I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. And when there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. So uh, you can visualize with me. Whoever is talking is saying that, that before the world was, I was brought forth. And so people read that in Proverbs chapter 8 and say that, listen, this is talking about Jesus. That Jesus is saying that, 
the Lord possess me. Those that seek me early shall find me. That before the earth was, I was brought forth. And they, they, they say that he was, he's describing himself. And reality is, in Proverbs chapter 8, it is talking about two individuals, primarily. In Proverbs chapter 8, the first individual, verse 1, doth not wisdom cry out. And understanding lift up her voice. And you can read it through its entirety, and you'll see that it never changes the subject of who it's talking about. So first off, who is, it, who is this that's doing the crying? Wisdom. Wisdom is crying, and it's being personified. But secondarily, wisdom is being personified as Jesus. So primarily we're talking of Jesus, but it's also being personified of Christ. Those that seek me early will find me. Is that not true of Jesus and wisdom? Those that love me will, will prosper. Those that turn their back up against me will falter. Is that not true of Jesus? And, and yes. From the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning of the earth or ever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. That was true of wisdom. Is that also true of Jesus, that from the beginning he was? Absolutely it is. Now, so don't read into it um, the way that we might think, because some people will say, well, look, it, it, there was a time in the past in which Jesus did not exist. Or if there was a time in the past in which he was not, did not exist, then by default he would not be eternal. Now, people get around that because they say, but no, he's of the same substance of his father. And because the father is eternal, therefore he is of the same substance of, of, of the father, and so therefore he is eternal. No, uh, if, if he is a created being, if he's a created being, then by default he's a creature. All right. If he is a created being, by default he is a creature. Which brings us into a, another problem. What is the, uh, the seventh day of his view? Then I'm going to look at what the Bible view, because it really doesn't matter what people think, but it's really, okay, what is the Bible view uh, of this topic? So seventh day of his Christians believe that there is one God, and that this one God is three co-eternal persons who work together in unity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and always will be. And I took that, you know, from uh, Adventist.org. Okay, that, that's like the official um, position and, and beliefs and so forth uh, of the church. And again, whether, whatever the church says is one thing, but really uh, that's not important. And what's important is what, is, you know, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach on um, this particular topic and so forth? Uh, because we're not concerned so much about what people think, but rather what the scriptures declare. As I mentioned before, the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible. But just because it, it does not appear for the sake of argument, it doesn't mean that it's evil. And as I mentioned before, Joe Average thinks of Trinity in one way, and, and maybe in the hierarchy, those who would have an understanding as such within the Catholic faith would think of it in a different way and probably different from what the laity would think of it. But the Bible does teach the concept of the Godhead. There is a concept of the Godhead. There are three texts in Scripture that we find. First, and the Bible does teach the concept, even in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, of one God, three eternal persons. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Romans 1 and verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul says in Acts 17, 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. So Godhead is mentioned in Scripture. Well, who are the members then uh, of the Godhead. Who are the members of, 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 of the Trinity, if you please? Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 
And God said, let us, notice, let us, plural. God talking, saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, etc. Well, who was present then when he says, let us? Because whoever he's talking to is involved in creation, would you not agree? Because he says, let, let, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Not let me make man in my image after my likeness, but let us make man. The pronouns as such. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, you know that that word Elohim is used. Which, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it just suggests gods. And not a belief in uh, polytheistic, um, but a monotheistic belief in the Hebrew understanding that, that there is one God, yet three divine persons. Now, how do you explain it all? I don't know. And whatever analogy you might try to come up with uh, would be unconscionable to use, because what analogy can you use to try to, to describe God? There's some people who talk about, you know, the water can be in like three parts. Uh, you can have the vapor and the gas and the liquid. But, but that's, those are just different forms. That's not the substance of God. There's no analogy that we can use to describe. You talk about us, people say, well, you know, we're, we're triune, the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. You know, well, those are different parts that come together to make up the whole person because you're not all mental, are you? You're not all physical, are you? You're not all spiritual, are you? No. So like those three come together to make up one. So you, we can't use that in comparison because it's not, you know, a, a piece of God here and then another piece and another piece and then together that makes up collectively God. One of my cartoons I used to watch as a, as a kid was Voltron. And, uh, I mean, mostly, you know, only the guys would probably maybe know of Voltron. I don't know. But Voltron was like he had these little tigers, like these robotic tigers and so forth. And they would, it's like maybe five of them or something like that, four or five. I don't remember the exact number. It's been so long. Uh, but, you know, always you, you kind of have the same plot line, right? Um, you know, villain comes up. It's a threat. Um, you have to assemble the whole robot together to be able to fight off the villain. And so, you, you know, one by themselves, they, they really couldn't do it. So they needed to come back together and they form like this, um, you know, man that had these arms and so forth, feet like, you know, with a lion and so forth. You know, again, most ladies like, you know, y'all watch that? Yeah, we, you know, that was like, that was great. You know, that was, that was great. Like, you know, ladies like, you know what, I, don't, it, I can't even understand the analogy. Well, don't understand the analogy to what I want to make is that there were different pieces that came together to form a substance. And some people think that that's how God is. Okay, you need the Father, you need the Son, you need the Holy Ghost, and then you put those three together, then you get, you know, God. That, that's not what the text is saying, that's not what the Scripture is talking about. But the Scripture is teaching that there is one God. And that God manifests himself, or that God reveals himself, or that God shows himself as three eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And there's not one person changing into various robes and so forth in appearances, but three eternal persons, but each separate, but each united, each God, uh, but not multiple gods. And yet again, how do you explain it? Um, well, if you figure it out, let me know. John chapter 1 and verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. So John says that, that by him, by the Word, all things were made. So again, back to Genesis chapter 1. Well, we know who was present then. Well, the Father was certainly there. I mean, no one really disputes that. The Son is seen here because it says that, again, all things are made by him. Verse 14 again says that that Word was made flesh. So we know it's him. Well, who else was present? Genesis, uh, Colossians 1, 13 through 17. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness 
and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Christ made all things. Who else was there? Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God, Elohim. He created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So who else was there? The Spirit of God. Or we might say the Holy Ghost. Now, I know that there are some people who say, well, look, the, the Holy Spirit is really, he's not God, that's God's Spirit. You know, it's like, you know, the arguments that people have. Uh, you know, I mean, the logic that people use, like, really? You know, because it says that his, his spirit, um, that that then means that that, because they say, well, no, he's not really, he's not God, but it's just God's spirit that's being sent. Well, the Bible talks about God's son. I mean, if you're going to use it to apply to the spirit, you need to use it to apply to the son. The Greek word again, Elohim's is, our Elohim is God's. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Our, our Jehovah uh, is Elohim is what it says. Our Yahweh is Elohim. Our one God is multiple in his majesty. He is one in communicating and conveying his will. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, uh, we certainly see uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In John chapter 20 and verse 17, we find that the Father is referred to as being God. I think it's important because, again, if we're going to go off the testimony of Scripture, then we must base our belief based off of what Scripture indicates, what Scripture teaches. And so in John chapter 20 and in verse 17, Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them that I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So for our purposes, Jesus is saying that the Father that he's going to is also who? Is God. Matthew 27, verse 41. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lamai sabbatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus taught that the Father was God. All right, and again, we can't have multiple gods because the Bible says thou shalt have no other God before me. So the scriptures preclude having multiple deities to worship. Is the Son God in John chapter 20 and verse 27 and 28? Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither your finger and behold my hands, and reach hither your hand and thrust it into my side, and don't be faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So Thomas refers to Jesus, in the flesh, mind you, as being his Lord, his master, and being his God. Matthew 20 and verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. While Jesus was on earth, he was able to receive worship of men. Now, if he was not God, he would have been violating the, command, the commandments. It was Jesus himself that said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But then he receives worship, and when the apostle says that, My Lord and my God, we don't see Jesus correcting him, saying, no, you know, uh, I'm your Lord, but I'm not your God. There's only one God. In Revelation, when John is envisioned and he sees the angel, he falls down on his 
on his hands and feet to worship the angel. And the angel says, uh-uh, uh, uh, see thou do it not, for I am of thy fellow servant and of thy prophet, the brethren's worship God. Well, if Jesus received worship and did not refuse it, then we are safe to conclude that Jesus was God. The Bible says that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 anyway, it says, and God was in the flesh, reconciling the world unto himself. Matthew chapter 1, Emmanuel, God with us. We ended up passing one. So we need to go over to uh, the book of Acts then. What about the Holy Spirit? Uh, turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5. Is the Holy Spirit God? In Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. Acts, the fifth chapter, in verse 3, it says, uh, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? To the Holy Spirit? And to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Verse 5 says, um, sorry, verse 4. It says, and, and whilst it remains, was it not your own? And when it was sold, was it not at your, in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but to God. Now, who did he say he was lying to first? The Holy Ghost. And then he turns around and says the same thing again, but just a different word. He says, you lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God. In 1 Corinthians chapter well, 2, verse 10 through 12, it talks about that no man can understand the things of God unless the Spirit is the one that reveals. Why? Because the Spirit is God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. He combines again the same concept then. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't put the fellowship of angels, uh, the companionship of angels, which that'd be a nice thing. Uh, the fellowship of the saints, the encouragement of the saints, that would be nice. Uh, but in this benediction and so forth that he is speaking of, then is um, it, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three uh, have invested themselves, given themselves entirely for the salvation of man, working tirelessly and ceaselessly that man may be able to be saved. And so from the, this purview of Scripture, we're able to understand that the Bible shows us then um, this character of God. And ultimately, Jesus came now to show us what God was like. To remove any misconceptions or misunderstanding that men would have as to the character and the nature of God, he came on earth to be able to show that. And he continued to testify in his life that I've come not from heaven to do my will, but I came to do the will of him that sent me. His mission was, was to be able to show men back to the Father. And each one had a role certainly to play uh, that, they were being, that they were fulfilling. The Father freely gave his son. Loved the world so much that he gave his son to come and to die for man. And the son came willingly to live and to die for man as a ransom. And the Holy Ghost then comes. Jesus said that when I leave, I'll send another comforter. And that he will lead you and guide you into all truth. And whatsoever he shall hear, that he's going to show you. And so the spirit then comes to be able to work. For what purpose? Because God is united uh, in his plan, his purpose, and his power of being able to save and to redeem unto the uttermost. And so when we look at the scriptures and we understand and know surely uh, what the Bible says. And I said at the beginning that, again, uh, doctrinal, doctrinal purity, though one strives for it and seeks to have it, there, there'll be people in heaven who won't understand, quote, or didn't know that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, that all three are one. There will be people in the kingdom who, who will not know that, uh, that Christ was not a created being. But they have come to find him as their personal savior. 
Uh, that that be became the capstone of their life. They surrendered their life. They were born again, and so they'll be in his kingdom. And, and, and again, the mysteries of, of divinity, which we do not understand, will be centuries, millennia, um, diving and understanding and continuing to learn and to be able to grasp. But the fundamental basic concepts are, are there and the framework is given in Scripture. And one thing we can be sure of is that we have a, a, an eternal God uh, who has given himself as our ransom. And that is the great mystery that God uh, in man reconciling the world unto himself. That we, mortal men who have transgressed in his law, can yet be saved and be a part of his family again. Now, Father in heaven, we thank you for the moments that we've had together to be able to look into your word. We thank you for the, the scriptures that you've given to us to be a light into our pathway. And I pray that you help us to become better acquainted with it. Uh, and as we search it, to be able to become better acquainted with you. Uh, may our thirst and quest be to learn more of you that we can see your character and, and to love you and to serve you more faithfully. I pray and thank you that uh, you would keep us in your way and in your will. Uh, forgive us again of all of our sins and transgressions. We ask and